Hello and welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. In this third series brought to you by the Global Cybersecurity Forum, you'll hear my frank and thought-provoking conversations about the challenges and opportunities shaping our cyber future. As I sit down with some of the world's greatest minds, eminent scientists and academics, captains of the private sector and policymakers. Joining me today in the studio is Dr. Janad Nabi, a senior researcher in healthcare strategy at Harvard Business School, where he examines how value-based healthcare strategies can transform care delivery and promote health equity. Dr. Nabi is a member of the World Health Organization's Working Group on Regulatory Considerations for Digital Health and Innovation, and a consultant for early stage technical groups developing machine learning based applications in healthcare. Moreover, in medical ethics, he introduced the concept of bioethical agility as a technical solution to optimize the development of ML based healthcare applications. Dr. Janad, it's wonderful to have you in the GCF podcast studio. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me. Share with our audience more about your research at Harvard and your work with companies in the United States, and indeed, what brought you to focus on digital health? So I have been in health policy for the past uh, several years, and I developed an interest in digital health because uh, from a US perspective, at least, and that is the space where I mostly operate, uh, we have a lot of waste in the system. Uh, in the US, there is an extreme, uh, extremely high level of spending on healthcare, but the outcomes that we are able to accomplish are not as good as they could be. Uh, So I believe a lot of that can be addressed with technology and that's why my focus is digital health. And being in that space, working with uh, different companies, some of them early state startups, some of them established companies, uh, I was uh, exposed to uh, the cybersecurity concerns uh, we have in the healthcare space because now what's happening is that there is a rapid uh, digitization of healthcare services. Uh, I'm sure you or someone you know has in the past few years, especially after COVID, used uh, online services to uh, interact with your healthcare provider. Sometimes a video chat, sometimes a text service, sometimes an email. So we are moving a lot of healthcare services online. And when we do that, when we operate in the cyberspace, then we are inherently vulnerable to the attacks in the cyberspace. And the interesting thing about healthcare is that healthcare data is unlike any other data. It's more sensitive. People are very careful about their health information. And it's also uh, unique in the sense that uh, compared to other kinds of data, for example, if someone's credit card information gets uh, leaked or uh, bank account information gets leaked, you could uh, contact your bank and you could reset some of those numbers. They could give you a new card. They could block the old old card. Uh, but it's not possible to do that with health information. Uh, if there is sensitive health information out there on someone, uh, it's permanent. And uh, that can lead to a lot of additional risk. And that's what you would see uh, in the dark uh, web where this data is sold. Uh, Healthcare data is quite expensive compared to other kinds of data. Break it down for me in terms of the most pressing concerns when it comes to our healthcare data and cybersecurity, when it comes to the ethics of healthcare and cybersecurity, paying particular attention to protecting, as we've been discussing, a patient's safety and sensitive health data. What would you say are the best courses of action as technology and healthcare delivery evolves? So in terms of the data infrastructure, Because we use a lot of electronic health records. A lot of that information is uh, on different servers or online. Now, uh, people are using digital services uh, to contact their healthcare providers. So we are uh, going towards uh, a new era in healthcare delivery, where a lot of these processes are being digitized. And so that makes it very concerning, uh, that how, how do we protect this data? At the same time, we don't have the awareness, Uh, we don't have the training to understand how do we protect this data. We often see uh, people are still uh, hesitant to use 
two-factor authentication uh, tools or even um, training uh, sessions that would train them in how to detect phishing emails or other scams. Why is that? I think people have not adopted or, or realized how much of the information is online or appreciate the risk of the information uh, that's online. And it's also segmented by generation, I would say, to some extent. It depends on region, country, age. Uh, as, as I'm sure you have seen, uh, the younger generations are quite comfortable sharing their data. And uh, I think that would, in the future, um, make us uh, change some of the conversations we're having at the moment. Because uh, folks who are in policy making right now, they are from a generation where they are very careful about sensitive information. But I have personally noticed that younger generations are not that concerned. Uh, I think a lot of times they do understand that to engage in the virtual space, they have to share a lot of information. And, and a lot of them are comfortable with that. Mm. So the risk perception is very different depending on who you're speaking with. Dr. Janad, how would you say that cybersecurity can have a positive impact when it comes to patient safety and trust? So when it comes to trust, uh, we know that there are only a couple of industries where trust plays a crucial role. Uh, one of them is healthcare, the other one being finance. And uh, there are some other industries where trust is not as important as the technical uh, services that are available to people. And so for healthcare, I would say it's going to take a lot of work for, for leaders to uh, foster that trust because we have more uh, uh, availability of bad news when we listen to some of the news that's reported in terms of the attacks that are happening. Uh, you might have heard about uh, the recent attack on change healthcare in the US yeah. uh, of a ransomware attack and it cost them 22 million dollars and they paid that amount but the damages could be almost a billion dollars uh, with that one attack so in in behavioral psychology there is this term called uh, availability bias where we uh, when we hear news or when we are exposed to information uh, that uh, that may distort the reality, we are biased towards that negative uh, uh, impression of that technology. So, I, because so much of this is happening in the media, it's being reported on, and th it's it's a good thing that it's being reported on. But I think there is not enough discussion on the positive side of uh, cybersecurity. So, uh, your your data, how much work it takes to encrypt it how much uh, the information technology professionals, how much they're working to ensure that people's uh, uh, data is protected. I don't think there's enough discussion on that. And, and that also leads to a lot of people feeling they don't have control over their data. Talk to me about the inequities that we know are prevalent in healthcare globally. Put in some perspective for us the size and scope of the problem and how to that end AI and ML might provide a more accurate global picture. So when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think there are several advantages of employing those technologies because they can process large amounts of data and they can recognize patterns which would take much longer if we were to do them manually. Uh, so that's, that's a big advantage of using these technologies. We can also automate some of the responses with these technologies, so we don't need as many people uh, to create robust infrastructure. But at the same time, we have seen that these technologies can also create problems uh, for, for cybersecurity uh, professionals because using generative AI or uh, large language models now we can easily create websites or emails that look very realistic. And that is also leading to more confusion in people where it's, it's so difficult sometimes to recognize uh, what is real and what's not real. Uh, and from an ethical perspective, we, we know that any kind of machine learning model or artificial intelligence technology is dependent on the data. Uh, you know, there's a saying uh, in, in, in uh, our work, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So when you have data that is not uh, representative of the population, 
then we see a lot of biases uh, in the in the outcome uh, outcomes that are generated. So we have to work a lot on that, and uh, we have to ensure that we are not uh, exacerbating the problems. And so that would require us to make more investments, uh, and uh, and forums as uh, GCF to have those discussions uh, that we need more representation in, in data collection, in data processing, so that the outcomes from these technologies are representative of the communities we live in. Looking back, COVID-19 really showed us the benefits of cross-border data exchange in a global health emergency, whilst obviously highlighting to the cyber risks. When it comes to the benefits of cross-border data sharing in the context of global public health, can you outline them for us, please? So the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated both critical importance and challenges of cross-border data exchange, especially for global health. Uh, some of the benefits of cross-border data exchange are uh, rapid information sharing happened at that time. This enabled quick uh, dissemination of uh, virus data, case numbers, research findings across borders, facilitating a coordinated global response. So that was a big mm -hmm. advantage. It also helped us develop uh, collaborative research. It allowed international researchers to share data and collaborate on vaccine development and treatment protocols, especially because the vaccine was often acting differently in different regions. So having that collaborative approach was very important. So we could develop targeted uh, population or country specific protocols. And then uh, there was a big benefit for contact tracing after, after the pandemic. Cross-border data exchange supported uh, tracking uh, virus spread across national boundaries. So uh, it, it, was, it was extremely helpful, and I, and I think we, l we learned a lot of lessons, and I, I hope we're able to apply them in the future. Regarding global cybersecurity and the healthcare space, if I were to ask you for your greatest hope and greatest concern for the 12 months ahead, what would you say? I think one of my biggest concerns would be, are we bringing the human element into the technology conversations? Are we highlighting that enough? And are we looking at uh, issues uh, such as behavioral psychology? How do these technologies act when they interact with the human? I think that's so crucial. And, and developing collaborations across industries. Uh, this year, we saw that a lot. We saw um, collaborations getting developed uh, between um, multinational institutions, uh, as well as uh, organizations that deal with economic development and, and other issues, they were ready and willing to collaborate with cybersecurity uh, professionals and organizations. And uh, GCF did a phenomenal job in bringing them together, having those conversations. So some of those concerns are addressed uh, in this meeting, and I hope in the next meeting we can, we can find, uh, we can measure that success and build on that even more. And what gives me hope is uh, the people. I, I believe uh, that when people are inspired, they can accomplish uh, grand challenges and they can really uh, bring out the best in us. And so having more uh, gatherings uh, as GCF and others, developing these collaborations with them, uh, that gives me a lot of hope. Dr. Janad, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Many thanks also to all of our listeners around the world. And if you'd like to hear more conversations like this one, just head to the Rethinking Cyber page on Apple and Spotify. Another podcast in this series will be coming very soon, so be sure to follow GCF on social media for updates. I also look forward to welcoming you on the ground at the 2025 annual meeting of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. Until then, take care and goodbye.